Good afternoon and welcome everyone to Mark Safety Corner brought to you by Fleet Complete and Big Road. My name is Claire and I'm a marketing coordinator for Fleet Complete and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule today to join Mark and I. If you haven't already, make sure to go grab a bite to eat or a cup of coffee and we hope that you enjoy the webinar. In today's webinar, our Fleet Complete big subject matter expert, Marc Mancian, is going to demystify the specific US HOS changes that will be coming into force at the end of this month. So for those of you that are joining this Fleet Complete Big Road webinar for the first time, here's Mark's background. Mark is the Vice President of Safety Compliance and Regulatory Affairs at Fleet Complete Big Road. He is known as an industry subject matter expert with over 25 years of experience in the transportation industry. He is also a former DOT MTO inspector who has worked in several enforcement roles with the Carrier Sanctions and Investigations Office prior to moving into private industry. Mark also participates on several federal state provincial and uh, sorry, federal state provincial regulatory bodies on both sides of the border. He was directly involved uh, in the development and delivery of the ELD mandate in the United States and is on the Transport Canada Task Force Committee for ELD in Canada that is just around the corner. He's also a social media influencer with over 15,000 LinkedIn followers and is managing the Transportation Safety Professionals Discussion Group on LinkedIn. If you haven't already done so, feel free to reach out to Mark uh, on LinkedIn or either of these locations at any time. Mark has also written over 100 blog topics about the transportation industry found at his Ask the Expert blog on our website. We'll make sure to include this link in our follow-up email so you can check it out. Now, enough about Mark. Just a, let's move on to a couple housekeeping items. So I'll be recording today's webinar and sharing the content on the Fleet Complete and Big Road follow-up email that you'll receive within 24 hours of this event. If you've already submitted questions prior to registering, it will likely be addressed in the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Throughout this webinar, if you do have any questions, you'll notice that in your Zoom control panel, you'll have a little box called Q&A. If you click on that box, you can enter questions at any point throughout the webinar. We'll make sure to address it at the end of the session. And if for some reason we run out of time, we'll make sure to send you a personal email with an answer from Mark to ensure that all questions are addressed. So now, um, just before kicking it off to Mark, I'd also like to highlight that we will be running a few poll questions during the webinar, and you can participate in these simply by ticking the box of the answer that you'd like to submit. And we'd love to get a better idea of what your thoughts are on these specific U.S. amendments. So now I'll pass it over to Mark. Thank you very much uh, for the warm welcome, Claire, and for introducing today's webinar topic, Understanding and Explaining the Hours of Service Change. The agenda for today's webinar is as follows. I will kick off by introducing why the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administrator amended the hours of service rules. I will then describe how FMCSA engaged stakeholders throughout this process. I will then move on to explain how the hours of service rules are subjected to specific types of drivers and motor carriers. From there, I will clear up any myths that may be floating around on social media or in truck stops that the new hours of service may have changed the way the ELD mandate has been managed. And I also want to explain, because we do have some Canadian and American uh, participants on this blog, I'm gonna really tie in how this affects Canadians going to the United States and Americans traveling north of the border. These rules, as you likely know, are quite different. So it's important that you understand what to do with your log when on either side of the border. I'll then get into the meat and potatoes about understanding the specific hours of service changes. As an FYI, this is where these poll questions that Claire mentioned will start showing up on your screen. The exceptions will include changes to the hours of service short haul. Then we'll be talking about new modifications affect adverse driving conditions, what is specifically referenced in terms of the mandatory 30 minute rest break, which is something specific in the United States and not Canada. I will then move on to explain how the new sleeper berth provisions are changing the way professional truck drivers can use this more flexible scenario to log in their duty statuses while in the United States. Again, these sleeper birth rules are different 
in Canada and in the United States. The key, of course, is that you truck, your truck must be equipped with a bunk if you're going to use a sleeper berth exemption. I will then move on to explain when the actual hours of service rules will take effect, as it is quite literally just around the corner. I will then bring you up to speed if you have not heard as of yet, there is an FMCSA hours of service pilot project that was recently announced by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. I'll explain at this time what FMCSA is trying to accomplish and the steps you have to take in the event that you or your drivers wanna take advantage of this pilot. I will then share some useful links I found on this topic, including the hours of service pilot. And thereafter, we will open up the floor for Q and A's. As Clara has mentioned, we already got a bunch of questions as part of the registration on this webinar, and they will be queued up as part of the Q and A session. If something comes to mind to you, while I'm presenting, you can still post a question in the Zoom text box. Just bear in mind that we've had a significant number of attendees and we only have one hour for this webinar. So if you don't get your question online, feel at ease knowing that I commit to answering your question and I will personally send you my answer in an email. I will then conclude the webinar with my final thoughts and you give you some dates on future webinars that may be of interest to you. Sound good? So let's just kick it off with the introduction. Elaine L. Chow, U.S. Secretary of Transportation announced on June 1st of this year that the FMCSA has revised the hours of service regulations based on four important provisions. There was really five changes, but there were four provisions. I want you to know there was some talk that this amendment may get delayed, and this was something similar to what we thought would happen with ELD. As I've just found, the new amendments are going to go forward. Essentially, back in the day when this announcement was first made, there were some groups in the United States that petitioned FMCSA to delay the launch to allow more research. There were some stakeholders on one side thinking the FMCSA went too far. On the flip side, there were other stakeholders that said FMCSA did not go far enough. The bottom line is the law will be proclaimed on September 29th, 2020. Therefore, carriers will be required as well as their drivers to comply with the new hours of service regulations on September 29th, 2020, just around the corner. So now we'll move on to explain why the US hours of service was changed. Well, essentially these changes were provided to give drivers more flexibility while at the same time, not adversely affecting safety. FMCSA acknowledged that the timing was right to make these changes. This was particularly the case when ELD was launched and there were a lot of feedback received by different stakeholder groups. So FMCSA went ahead and provided some regulatory proposals. And in addition, it was really with a timing perspective with COVID-19, it really gave the opportunity for FMCSA to petition to Congress to seek some hours of service relief, to provide truckers with some more flexibility and adding some new rules would provide savings to the industry strengthen the economy, create new jobs, and really strengthen the motor carrier industry. So now I'll just move on to just touching briefly on how FMCSA engaged stakeholders. There was really a three-step process that FMCSA used. Back in 2008, the first was the advanced notice of rulemaking. In total, there was roughly 5,000 public comments that were sent regarding how the hours of service rule should be changed to ease the regulatory burden on professional truck drivers and let them become more productive. As an FYI, I want you to know that I put in my two cents and provided commentary back to FMCSA as part of this advanced rulemaking. From there, 
FMCSA went away and took all of the different uh, suggestions made and identified four specific changes which incorporated five hours of service rules that they thought would meet the needs of the industry. Again, it was pushed out to industry at this point. There was another 3,000 comments that were sent back by stakeholders, including myself. And FMCSA has taken those comments and has now moved into the final phase, which is the implementation phase, which essentially is the new hours of service regulation, which will take effect, as I said, on September 29th, 2020. So let's now move on to explaining who in fact is subject to the hours of service rule. Well, I want to say at the very outset that the rules themselves have not changed. Specifically, drivers of a commercial motor vehicle that is used as part of business, involved in interstate commerce, and fits any of these descriptions according to Part 390 of the General Motor Carrier Safety Regulations must comply. These descriptions include a vehicle that has a gross vehicle weight rating or combination gross weight rating of 10,001 pounds, or for those in Canada, 4,536 kilograms or more, whichever is greater. Now, for those of you in the audience that are part of the motor carrier, intercity carrier, passenger carriers segment, it would be a commercial motor vehicle that has designed seats for and used by eight or more passengers. Now the key operative word here is for compensation. If there is no compensation, then the motor coach must be designed or used to transport more than 15 passengers. And that would include the driver incidentally, but with no compensation. The final is if the vehicle is used in transporting hazardous materials under 49 CFR 5103, and the actual hazmat quantity is in an amount requiring the goods to be labeled inside the commercial motor vehicle and the vehicle or combination of vehicles to be placarded. Now at this point, I think it's a good idea that we switch gears and just understand what exactly these hours of service changes are. So I'm gonna start off with the short haul exception, which is the first exception. Essentially, anyone that uses the current short haul exception understands that it was always based on a 100 air mile radius with a maximum duty period of 12 hours. Canada, incidentally, has a similar rule, but it's based on a 160 kilometer radius. As a point of interest for those of you that may not be aware of this fact, in the short haul exception, you'll see the term air mile. I want you to know that the air mile is a different measurement from a statute mile on a road map. An air mile, incidentally, is more than a statute mile. For those that really read regulations such as myself, let it be known that there are 6,076 feet in an air mile and 5,280 feet in a statute mile. Therefore, you may not have known, but in the old rule, the 100 air mile radius was actually 115.08 statute miles. Many of you may not have known this fact that you had an additional 15 miles in which you thought. Therefore, a 100 air mile radius from your work reporting location was actually 115 statute or roadmap miles. Or again, for those of you in Canada, 185.2 kilometers. In addition, property and passenger carriers using the short haul exception were not required to use a record of duty status log, an ELD, an AOBRD, or any part thereof. And they were also exempt from the 30 minute rest break. This is according to part 395.1E subsection one. The final hours of service to this short haul exemption has now been extended. It has gone from 100 air miles to now 150 air miles as of September 29th, 2020. To my point above, 
since we're now moving to this 150 air mile radius, your professional truck driver's reporting location, the new radius is actually 172.6 statute miles, or again, for our Canadians out there, 278 kilometers. Secondly, very important, this 150 air mile radius rule also extends the maximum duty period from 12 hours to 14 hours. So you, your drivers get an additional two hours in addition to the additional 57 air miles, or again, for the Canadian audience, additional 92 kilometers. This would be the radius distance from the professional driver's work location and the two additional hours granted under this new rule, exempting drivers from a record of duty status or log. Now, moving on to the next slide, it's important to note that there are no other Part 395 short haul exemptions that have changed. Specifically, this new hours of service rule does not change the non-CDL short haul exception for property carrying drivers that many of you may not be aware of. There is an actual non-CDL exception that if you're professional truck drivers in this audience, you probably weren't even aware of this rule. I wanna stress one other very important point. This is really important. This is something that many carriers and many drivers unfortunately find out the hard way during a safety audit. So let me explain. I'll go back to the good old days when I was a DOT inspector and an auditor because I performed both jobs. As an inspector, I would stop a professional driver at roadside or at a way station. I would ask that driver where he started his or her day, where he or she was going and where that day was going to end. If it was within the 100 air mile radius that the driver was operating and returning to, to his or her starting point, that driver was exempt from status log at roadside. Now, what would get tricky would be in those instances where I would take my inspector hat off and I would put my auditor hat on. I would then go to the motor carrier's principal place of business. If I thought the driver I just stopped and happened to be running over his or her maximum drive time or has shortened the off-duty time, but was using the short haul exemption to not surrender records to me at roadside. I would then go to the safety place of business, the terminal that the driver works for, and I would speak to the safety manager, and it would go something like this. I just stopped Mr. Smith, your driver, the other day. He was running under the short haul exception. As a motor carrier, I need to see your accurate records for Mr. Smith. And again, nothing has changed here, whether it's the 100 air mile radius or the 150 air mile radius, a motor carrier is still required to keep accurate records. If the motor carrier does not have accurate records, then the driver in theory needs a log. These accurate records must include the start and end time for the driver's day, the total hours on duty for that day, when the driver is relieved of responsibility, and the end of the day. If these records are not available, then that is a problem. So from our perspective, in order to take advantage of this short haul, it's important you know, you extend to 150 air miles now. You can now go from 12 hours to 14 hours of on duty, but you cannot extend beyond that. We must know what your start and end times are for when your shift starts and ends. If you are, and this is interesting, if you're a passenger carrier hauling intercity people, you have to take eight hours off between your 12 hours on duty. Coincidentally and interestingly, you have actually 10 hours if you're a property carrying person moving goods in each 12 hour of on duty time. You must include the start time when the driver reports each day. You have to include the time the driver ends his day and you must include when they're released at the end of the day. So bottom line is, you know, a lot of our customers 
when they hear about this, they say, well, let's just use a record of duty status. The other thing I want to talk about, because this is really important, maybe a little bit off topic, but I want to tie this into ELD because it's really important. So there are these exceptions under this amendment, but there's also exceptions under ELD. So I want to just explain, there's, there's really four exceptions that you want to talk about. Drivers operating under the short haul exception, which would go from 100 to 150, you can still continue using time cards. These time cards is something that has to be maintained at the driver's place of business. Again, if the driver is subject to an audit, these records have to be available for six months. This is not changed in any way, shape or form. This is why many of our customers have decided elected to go with ELD just to take the mystery out of this equation. If the driver happens to go outside the radius, he or she will still be protected with the ELD. Same compliance protections is afforded to drivers. If a short haul motor carrier happens to be audited, you've got the records. The second exemption under ELD is the eight and 30 rule, which you've probably heard. This is, I get a lot of questions about, this is the Murphy's Law scenario where the driver periodically goes in and out of the eight day and every 30 day window and sometimes needs the logs and other times does not lead the logs. In those instances, Murphy's Law will say that your odds of your driver or if you happen to be the driver getting stopped on the ninth day will happen when, when you don't have an ELD. So as I said earlier, in those cases, this is why many of our big road clients forgo this risk and continue to use an ELD. The difference though, is that the driver who's deploying ELD will simply not have to surrender that device to DOT when using this eight day out of every 30 day window. If the driver happens to be on his ninth day, he or she is protected. There's a third option. It's really a niche market. It's drive away, tow away operations. That's when the vehicle being driven is the commodity being delivered. You don't see a whole lot of those. The last exception is for drivers for vehicles manufactured before the year 2000. So these are some ELD exceptions that are woven into this new amended hours of service requirement. So I want to now move on to the short haul exception and the record keeping. But before we do that, I'd like to uh, ask Claire to just put out the first poll question. And really I'd like to know, do you think the changes to the short haul exception will make it easier for you and your drivers will have no impact on you or your drivers or will actually make it worse? Because I'm curious to know, I have a lot of contacts with FMCSA and some of the feedback I'll get, I'll certainly share with them. So if you wanna go ahead and just vote on the button that you think is most appropriate to you, that would be great. We'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. All right, so I've just seen the results of the poll and I wanna take this opportunity to thank you very much for submitting your answer. What I'm seeing is that 53% of you say it will have no impact on your operations. The short haul will kind of be neutral, will not help or not make it worse. 45% uh, of you are saying that it will make it easier and actually 2% are saying it will make it worse. I'd love to hear from those of you who said it would make it worse so that you can explain to me specifically in which way that this would be worse. So if you could send something to ask the expert at our homepage, that'd be wonderful. Okay, so we'll close that off, Claire. Now I wanna move on now to talk about the next uh, condition or the next exception. And this one here is with respect to 
adverse driving conditions under Part 395. Under the previous hours of service rule, adverse driving conditions were meant to be operating a commercial motor vehicle in snow, sleep, fog, or other adverse conditions as if the highway was covered with snow or ice or unusual road conditions and traffic conditions. Again, for our Canadian friends, we have a similar rule up here in Canada. The key point with this and why it is different is under the previous rule, it was had to be not apparent or known to the person dispatching the professional truck driver on the run prior to its starting. There was no reference in the previous rule to a driver having the discretion to decide if the conditions were adverse or not. Everything was based only on the information known to the person dispatching the driver at the time it started. Under this new adverse driving condition definition, the FMCSA included the driver in the equation to determine adverse road conditions. Now to me, this sounds like a no brainer because after all, you know, I'm former driver myself, the driver should be first and center, front and center to determine if the roads are adverse or not. I'm not sure if you agree with that, but that's my thought on it. So in this new rule, FMCSA has now given the driver more leeway in the decision-making process to decide what is and what is not adverse driving conditions. The only thing that remains consistent with the previous in the new rule is that these conditions must not have been known or apparent or known to the driver and or the dispatcher. In the case of the new rule, it's after a qualifying rest break or a sleeper break or for a motor carrier prior to dispatching the driver. So in my perspective on it, it shows a little more flexibility because the driver is involved in the decision making. Make sense? Secondly, under the adverse driving conditions, previously drivers were granted an exception to the 10 hours off duty requirement and the 10 hour or the 11 hour maximum driving limits when these unforeseen adverse driving conditions affected their ability to move goods under normal circumstances. The adverse driving conditions did not extend the 14 hour window for property carrying and did not extend, interestingly, the 15 hour window for passenger carrying. Under this new rule, under this amendment, the 14 hour window is extended by two hours with adverse conditions. It is also important to note that the two hours of additional driving time applies to both property carrying under the 14 hour window, which now essentially gives you 16 hours under part 395.3 subsection A2. And also interestingly, passenger carrying drivers are equally granted the two hours of additional driving to then extend their 15 hour window to 17 hour window. So that's really interesting. When the regulations were, were written, you would think it would be the other way around that passenger carriers would be a little more restrictive, but interestingly, they're more flexible for the motor coach industry, which again, I'm sure some of you did not know that. So again, Claire, if that's okay, I would like to move on to the next poll question. Do you think, or have you ever used the adverse condition exception in the past? Yes, you have used it. You've used it sometimes. You've used it rarely. And you, or you've never used it. I'd like to know because I used to, again, audit a lot of logs and this is a, an exception your drivers can use. I'm not thinking you should use it every day because it's not normal driving conditions. It's not because the shipper has slowed you down. It's not because you're having a busy day, but it's unknown conditions. So I'd just like to know if it's been used by you or your drivers. So if you wouldn't mind just submitting your answer, that'd be great.
All right, again, thank you very much for your responses. And as you can see, there's a mix here. So 18% of you or your drivers have used adverse conditions. Some have used it only sometimes. 36% of you have used it rarely. And 30% of you have never used it. I find that very interesting because this is an opportunity, as I said, for you and your drivers to protect yourself, to protect the driver, to educate your drivers. When things unforeseen happen, you should really consider taking advantage of this rule because use the amendment, use the regulation to your driver's best interests. I see, unfortunately, occasions in the past in my old world where this exception has not been used, the driver hasn't annotated, and the driver has gone over his hours and it has in some cases led to citations which were not necessary had the driver taken advantage of this exception. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. You can shut that now. Well, now I just wanna use an example just to illustrate how this new adverse driving conditions can be applied. So say for example, and this happens quite regularly, you have a driver who's say like 15 miles away from his or her destination. When she arrives at a situation, it could be an accident, it could be someone's pulled over, there could be a gravel spill, there could be water flowing over a bridge. And you got the poor driver saying, look, I'm 15 miles from my home. You think I'm gonna shut it down? You know, I've otherwise complied with all of the rules. There's gotta be another way to do this. Well. I'd say use these adverse drive conditions. The bridge in this case is the only access to your final destination. The driver essentially has like an hour left to drive and one hour left on the 14 hour day. In this case, the driver can stop at the next exit for up to two hours until this roadway is clear or the bridge is clear. And that will not affect their 14 hour window the driver would still have time to get to his or her original destination without violating the hours of service regulation. Now, this is something I'm gonna stress because again, the CYA principle, as you probably all know, it's not written anywhere in the regulations, but I strongly encourage your drivers to annotate in the remarks section, include all of the details on the 2nd of February, 2021 at 6.47 a.m. stopped at mile marker number seven, bridge closed, highway closed, um, using adverse road conditions to extend two hours of driving. That is clearly marked in the exception in the remarks, not required by regulation, but it takes the mystery, it takes the debate away. And it particularly does so, again, putting my former auditor hat on. When the auditor sees a violation, like I'm telling you, your driver, don't violate the law or don't fudge your log. Don't, don't try to play with the log. Just say it as is. Just say, look, I had to extend my day, adverse conditions. They'll see the two additional hours of driving. The annotation will take the mystery out of the debate. And this is where it's going to be the difference between the auditor saying, tap your driver on the back and tell him he did great to having a debate and let's go to court and talk about this. So I'm just saying annotate, annotate, annotate. So I wanna move on. I think we've uh, talked a lot about the adverse road conditions. Let's talk about the 30 minute break. Under the provisions of the new rule, the 30 minute rest break was previously tied to his or her on duty time from the first start of the day. Canada, incidentally, does not have this 30 minute rest break. It's more of a best practice, but it isn't anything written in terms of our regulations up here in Canada. So strictly a US thing. Now, bear in mind for you Canadian drivers going to the US, if you're crossing the border, you had better take your 30 minute rest break because you must comply with the US rules when in the United States. So probably the easiest way to explain this is to think of the sands in an hourglass. And if everybody's ever done that before, you basically turn the hourglass over. In the old world, from the start of your day, when you go on duty, you'd have eight hours 
and then you'd have to take your 30 minute rest break. Specifically, property carrying professional drivers were required to take this 30 minute break. This 30 minute break could be either satisfied with a 30 minute off duty or a 30 minute in the sleeper berth or a combination thereof. Under the new rule, the 30 minute rest break is still required. However, it gives you a little more flexibility because it's not based on the start of your on duty time now. It is based on eight hours of driving. So I wanna go back to my sands in the hourglass example. So now in this new world, you turn the hourglass upside down and it starts trickling sand every time you or your driver are now behind the wheel and are starting to drive, not when you are going on duty. So driving for the first time, you would then turn the sands of the hourglass over and then you'd have eight hours of driving. Now this is really key. This is eight hours of cumulative driving, not consecutive driving. That's very key as well. So again, as soon as you're behind the wheel, you flip that hourglass over, you start losing sand, you stop driving. And when you stop driving, it's like there's a magical switch that automatically stops the hourglass from dropping sand. Once you start driving again, that switch turns back on and the hourglass of sand starts trickling until you run out of eight hours of driving. Once that happens, you have to take your 30 minute break. Make sense? What's also new, and this is kind of cool for, for many drivers because again, I, I used to stop and inspect drivers at roadside. I used to do audits. Drivers would creatively say they're off duty when in fact you're doing active duty on behalf of the motor carrier. Under the new rule, this new 30 minute break can be satisfied. You can either still take your off duty time, you can still take your sleeper berth time. The new flexibility you can use on duty, not driving time to satisfy your rest break. Now again, for accuracy purposes on the driver's log, please tell your driver not to book himself or herself off duty or sleeper. If they're actually on duty driving, claim the on duty not driving because that's some of the creativity that is happening in the past that this amendment was changed to allow drivers to properly reflect what they're doing in the day. On duty time in this new rule can count towards a 30 minute break. So I just wanted to emphasize that. So this means you know your driver can still remain productive performing some on duty tasks that will not count as part of the 30 minute rest break. The new rule also allows a driver to combine the 30 minutes into separate types of breaks. You can take a 10 minute off duty time with a 10 minute sleeper burst time and a 10 minute on duty not driving time or any combination of those three. The only stipulation is that those 30 minutes must be in a block of consecutive time. So again, next poll, Claire, I'd like to ask, are you currently exempt from having to take the 30 minute rest break because you under a short haul exception. I'd be interested to know that because it'll tell me whether or not you are like doing day runs and returning back to your place of business or you're more so doing long haul runs. And if you are, you're not exempt under the short haul rules and you must take this 30 minute break. So we'll give you a few seconds to answer that question. See, we're getting a lot of questions here too, which is really great. So basically under the share poll, 61% of you are not exempt from the 30 minute break. So that means you can take advantage of this rule now to adopt on duty, not driving time because only 20% of you are exempt and the 20 that are exempt also does not apply to them. So 
Thank you for that answer. So I just wanted to give you like a visual explanation. If a driver drove for four hours and took a 15 minute break and then drove another four hours, because the driver did not take a full 30 minute break, that driver would now have to take a 30 minute break because 15 minutes was not sufficient. So in order to illustrate this, I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's begin by assuming that this driver has driven for eight hours and now needs a 30 minute break. As you can see, if we were operating under the previous rule, only the top log would be compliant because in the top log, the driver is actually going off duty. In the second example, the driver is going on duty, not driving, as you can see on the graph grid. So if you're operating under this new rule, you're still claiming your on duty time, but that on duty time counts towards your break. So in either case, example two, you would be compliant in both cases. It's important to note as well that the short non-consecutive periods cannot be combined into 30 minutes. It must be one block of time. So next I wanna move on to our sleeper birth provisions. And cause this has changed again, uh, the rules are different in Canada and the United States. I wish these rules would be the same in both countries, but that's not the case. So by way of a quick overview, the current rules for using sleeper birth allows the driver to split 10 hours of off-duty time into two separate rest periods. The short rest period can be in or out of the sleeper berth, but must be at least two hours currently. Based on what we talked about earlier, if you are a driver who wants to take advantage of the, the new sleeper berth rules, and at the same time must still take a 30 minute rest break by the eighth hour, probably the easiest thing to do is by the eighth hour of cumulative driving, simply take two hours of, of rest because you're killing two birds with the same stone. That makes sense? Secondly, the second what I call the long rest must be at least eight consecutive hours and it must be in the sleeper berth. The two rest periods combined must equal 10 hours in order to qualify as a rest period. And I've had some questions, I'm quickly glancing at them, so hopefully I'm answering your questions as, I, as, you, as we go but it could be seven and three hours to equal 10. It could be seven and a half hours and two and a half hours to equal 10. It could be seven and three quarter hours and two and two quarter hours to equal 10. It could be a combination of any one of those, but one cannot be less than seven, the long rest. The short rest cannot be less than two. The equivalent of both must equal 10. In addition, and this is really important to know because this is new, when these two qualifying rest periods are used together, neither of these rest periods will count towards your 14 hour window. In the old rule, the short rest, the short two hour at two and eight rest, the two hour rest would count towards the 14 hour window. In this new rule, the short and the long rests are basically turning the sands of the hourglass off again towards your 14 hour. So again, I want to illustrate on the next slide how this works. So we have, beginning with the assumption that the driver has started day one with a fresh clock. That driver has taken a full 10 consecutive hours off or is complying otherwise with the sleeper burst split requirements or has taken the 34 hour reset. None of the four breaks in these two examples that you'll see will count towards the 14 hour window. It's like you're bridging this time and you're allowing yourself to extend the day as you're not locked in to the two and eight or seven and three towards the 14 hour. I'm getting some questions on the Q and A just quickly. Those are your two scenarios. In Canada, it's different. In Canada, if you're riding as a single driver, as a team driver, you can have different splits. These are the splits in the United States, just so you know. So you must look at either side of the qualifying rest period to see if the driver has complied with the 11 hours and the 14 hour rule on either side of those two splits. But I want you to understand that if you're taking the proper rest, you're turning the sands of the hourglass off and you are extending your 14 hour day. 
So we'll look at example one. The driver goes from midnight to 7 a.m. His first active period is on duty, not driving. Then you get one hour of on duty, not driving, plus six hours of driving time for a total of seven hours of on duty, not driving for the first active period. You don't count the period between 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. against your 14 hour window, as this is a qualifying rest period of three hours. You then resume counting the second active period for driving from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. This two hours of on duty not driving between 7 a.m. followed by five hours of driving between 12 and 5 p.m. gives you a total of seven hours duty and that's your second active period. The total of the first active period of driving six hours plus the total of the second active period of five hours gives you 11 hours of driving. The total of the first active rest period is seven hours with the total active rest period in the second will not count towards your 14 hour day. The second qualifying rest period starts at 5 p.m. to 12 midnight. The total rest period in this sleeper birth time is seven. So you are complying with the seven and three split. The total hours of the first qualifying rest period of three hours plus the total hour of the second qualifying rest period of seven is 10. Therefore, you're good. Then we move to example set number two. From midnight to 7 a.m. is the first active period. You've got on duty, not driving. You get one hour of on duty plus six hours of driving for a total of seven hours of on duty, not driving for the first active period. You don't count the period between 7 and 9 a.m. against the 14 hour window as this is a qualifying rest period of two hours. You then resume counting the second active period for driving and on duty from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. This is one hour of on duty not driving followed by five hours of driving, followed by one hour of on duty not driving for a total of seven hours on duty not driving as your second active period. The total first active period for driving is six hours. The total of the second active period of driving is five. That gives you 11. That's your maximum, you're good to go. The total active rest period, or sorry, your total first active on duty not driving period is seven hours, plus the second total on duty active period of on duty not driving, seven hours. You got 14 hours of on duty not driving. So again, you're, you can stretch your 14 day window. It's, um, you know, I'd have to get in more granular, but th that's how you would be compliant in these cases. This clock just becomes a, a continuing rolling of the clock with the off duty and sleeper birth times qualifying as rest periods with the active periods before and after each sleeper birth to not exceed 11 hours and not exceed 14 hours. All right. So we'll move on to the next poll question. I know we're starting to get low on time, but are your vehicles are equipped with sleeper berths? Because it'd be important to know if your vehicles are equipped with sleeper berths, your drivers can take advantage of this exception. So go ahead and submit your submit your your uh, your query there. See, we're getting lots of questions. So basically 66% of you have sleeper births, so two thirds. So I would really take advantage of this sleeper, new sleeper birth rule to grant you the additional flexibility. So now we're gonna move on to when the hours of service will take effect. Essentially drivers and carriers must operate under these new rules after or on September 29th, not before. There is no grandfathering clauses whatsoever. I want you to know as well that our Big Road Hours of Service solution has been updated to reflect all of these new changes. So there's no need to worry about on that front. Just quickly, I wanna ask my final poll and it's basically, do you think that the FMCSA has moved perhaps too quickly on this regulatory change or not? So yes, too fast, no, should have been done a while ago or three, not sure. Give you a few seconds to 
answer that one. Now, in terms of all these questions, it just keeps on climbing and there's no um, logistically a way for me to answer all these questions in this short window. So I'm going to commit to answering them individually and I'll send them off to you. So overwhelmingly, these changes should have been done a while ago, 70%, whereas 29 are not sure and one is too fast. So I want to talk quickly a little bit about the pilot project. This is something new, hot off the press. The FMCSA wants to uh, put a pilot to give additional relief to property carrying commercial motor vehicle drivers within the 14 hours of after coming on duty. During the pilot, this will be known as the split duty pilot program where drivers would have the option to pause their 14 hour on duty period, which is also called their driving window with one off duty period of no less than 30 minutes and no more than three hours. I want you to know that participants would be limited to only a certain number of CDL holders who meet specific criteria. And I'm thinking likely your SMS scores would have to be satisfactory for you to qualify. What the FMCCA wants is to really gather information about the timing of this flexibility and perhaps another amendment to the rules. So if you wanna participate, just go to the next slide because it's gonna give you some more flexibility there's contact information. You may want to take a, a snapshot of these slides, a snapshot of this particular one, because there's a, this Nicole Michelle with FMCSA. You got her email information, her telephone number, and you merely have to reach out to her. You just have to do a Google search, HOS Pilot. There's the website, fmcsa.gov. Uh, dot, dot, dot and it'll get you to uh, Miss Michelle. So next is I just want to include some useful links and this may be something else you may just want to take a snapshot of. Part 395, the actual federal register that describes it, a summary of hours of service changes, the pilot project. If you go on the fleet complete or big road sites, I have my own button that I'm really proud of. It's called Ask the Expert. You just have to click that button and ask me a question about anything really. We're talking hours of service today, but talk to me about just about anything. So really in conclusion, these hours of service rules are only applicable to federal interstate carriers while operating a commercial motor vehicle in the United States. If you're traveling within a state or into Canada or Mexico, I just want you to be aware that you must comply with those specific rules in those jurisdictions because these rules are specific to the United States for federal carriers under CFR 49 or 395. So we're gonna move on to um, the Q&A session. I know we've only got about five minutes to go, but again, I commit, I'm gonna answer all your questions. You will get an email from me, okay? Awesome. So. Thanks so much, Mark. That was great. I know we just have three minutes here, so let's see how many we can get through. Um, our first question is from an anonymous attendee, and it's, will the HOS final rule affect ELDs? So there's going to be no change to the ELD requirements with the exception of how the exemptions apply for the short haul and that whether you meet the four requirements as I've described in the slides above. So the 8 and 30 rule, drive away, tow away, vehicles under the model year 2000. Otherwise, there's no change to, to ELD in any way. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, what is a qualifying rest break based on how it is used in the adverse driving conditions definition? All right, so this, that's a great question. So in this new rule, the conditions cannot be known or could not reasonably be known. And reasonably to be known is your discretion, really. So the driver would immediately prior to beginning the duty day or immediately before beginning driving after a qualifying rest break or a sleeper birth period. The qualifying break would include one of the two sleeper birth periods or the rest periods, a 10 hour consecutive off duty period or the mandatory 30 minute rest break. So those are the qualifying periods. Great, um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more. 
So the next one from an anonymous attendee is, are there any restrictions on how often the adverse driving conditions exemption can be used? There's really no restrictions to that. But again, to my point I made earlier, I would strongly urge your drivers to annotate in the comments section to explain what's going on there. Awesome. So the, the last question is, can the adverse driving conditions exception be used to cover delays caused by detention time from a shipper, a breakdown or enforcement inspections? So the answer would be no to that. Um, the only thing is if there's a breakdown at roadside, which is not foreseen, you can use that. But things such as delays in loading or unloading or stuff to that nature would be no. You can't use it for that. Okay, great. Um, well, I guess we'll just end it here. Anyone that did not get their question answered, Mark will reach out to you personally with an answer to your question. Mark, thank you so much for all of that useful content. It was so insightful. And uh, thank you for your time today for joining us, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. I'm sorry I've given you a whole lot of info, but please do not hesitate to reach out to me. If I don't get to you, I will answer your question. So thank you all again for your time.